Hi, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Klein. I am a clinical dietitian. Um, I am also a certified nutrition support specialist. And today I'm going to be talking to you about enteral nutrition complications that you might see and how to manage them. So when we talk about nutrition complications seen with enteral nutrition, they typically fall into four main categories. Um, nutritional complications, mechanical complications, gastrointestinal complications, and metabolic complications. So today I'm just going to break down these four categories and different issues you might see. All right, starting with nutritional complications. These will include overfeeding and underfeeding. So first we'll start with overfeeding. This occurs when Patients are getting calories and protein in excess of what their nutrition needs are. And so you're likely to see this in patients that are eating an oral diet in combination with getting supplemental enteral nutrition therapy. Um, you might also see it if you know, you're transitioning from parental nutrition to enteral nutrition. Um, and that's just you're having calories and protein coming from all these different sources and you're actually ending up overfeeding these patients. Um, and so some signs of overfeeding would be hyperglycemia, um, azotemia, or when the blood urea and nitrogen gets elevated. Um, you could also see fluid overload. And so really what you want to do in this situation is just assess how many calories the patient is getting from their oral diet or from their enteral nutrition itself or any other source of calories and making sure that um, you're adjusting the nutrition regimen to make sure they're not getting too many calories or protein. So next up we have underfeeding. So the opposite problem when a patient is not getting enough calories or protein from their enteral nutrition regimen. And so this can be for a, a variety of reasons. So it could be on the inpatient side, patients are kept busy throughout the day with tests, procedures that the tube feeds need to be held for. And so it may just be difficult to get in enough nutrition during the day. Um, or it could be they're not tolerating or they're not appropriate for enteral nutrition at that time due to their, how severely ill they might be or um, if they have some kind of obstruction going on. So that might be a time when we're underfeeding these patients on, on the inpatient side. Um, in the outpatient setting, sometimes patients are not meeting their calorie goals um, for a variety of reasons also. It could be they have a busy schedule, they might meet, miss a tube feed, um, they might not be aware of how many cartons exactly they're supposed to infuse during the day, um, it, you know, for, you know, whatever other reasons that they're just not getting in enough of their um, tube feed goals for the day. Um, and so signs of underfeeding would be things like um, weight loss, um, hypoglycemia and uh, poor wound healing. So the, the weight loss and the poor wound healing might be more like long term that you, you start realizing that the patient's being underfed um, and hypoglycemia is more of a short term indicator that they're, they're um, not getting enough nutrition. All right, so next up will be mechanical complications. So this includes aspiration, um, enteric tube injury, and then enteric tube clogging as well. We'll start with aspiration. So aspiration is defined as inhalation of gastric contents into the lungs. And this can happen from tube feeding itself. It gets infused into the stomach and a patient might have reflux or vomiting and then it ends up um, coming up and going, you know, down their trachea and into their lungs. Um, this can also be, you know, their oral secretions that they have, they're not able to manage appropriately and um, swallowing their saliva also, you know, down their trachea into their lungs. And this can be a severe complication just because it can lead to a pneumonia um, and uh, just have some, some bad complications as a result. Uh, some risk factors for aspiration include um, decreased level of consciousness, gastroparesis, um, inability to maintain the head of bed greater than 30 degrees, um, all of these increase risk for aspiration. 
And so we really want to prevent aspiration from happening since it, it can be such a severe complication. So we always want to make sure when two feeds are infusing, the head of bed is greater than 30 degrees. Um, if a patient is at high risk for aspirating, we'll typically only do continuous tube feeds for them. Uh, we would also want to try and do a concentrated formula um, just to minimize the total volume of the enteral feed so that, um, you know, there's not too much volume going in at once and increasing the chance of, um, you know, nausea, vomiting, um, aspirating. And then lastly, we can also obtain small bowel access. So instead of feeding into the stomach itself, we'll advance the tube into the jejunum. That way, um, you know, the uh, tube feed formula isn't going to reflux back um, up into the, um, the mouth area. All right, next up, we're going to talk about enteric tube injury or displacement. Now, this complication is commonly seen in short-term access tubes. So think like a nasoenteric tube or a um, orogastric tube. And when these tubes are getting placed, there's the risk of getting sinusitis or inflammation of the nose, um, epistaxis or bloody nose. Um, if the tube stays in the nares for a long period of time, you're running a risk of getting skin breakdown. Um, things like inflammation of the nose and a bloody nose, those are just kind of short term and will resolve with minimal intervention. Um, but the skin breakdown you worry about when a, a nasal tube is in for longer than four to six weeks. Um, displacement can also happen. Um, so typically when you're placing a feeding tube, you'll, um, you'll, the provider will place the tube and you know take an x-ray to make sure it's going where it needs to be whether it's in the stomach or in the jejunum and then they'll mark on the tube itself how far in the tube is and there's either like a mark on the tube or like it'll be noted what centimeter the tube is placed into just so we can make sure that the tube is still at where it's supposed to be. And so frequently in the hospital, um, sometimes patients will pull out the tube. Um, oftentimes it's accidental just due to repositioning or you know they're sleeping at night and they accidentally catch it on something. Sometimes patients come in and they you know have altered mental status. Um, they get confused, they pull out the tube. Um, sometimes people don't like having the tube in and then they end up uh, just pulling out the tube because they don't want it there anymore. It's uncomfortable. Um, and then also you, you occasionally will see patients have um, vomiting that can dislodge the tube to make it kind of come out a little bit. Um, and so some ways that we can prevent both skin breakdown and then also displacement would be trying to secure the tube to the nose in as comfortable way as possible. So um, you can see in these pictures, you can tape it to a patient's nose to, to keep it in place. You can also do what's called bridling the tube. And so what that entails is placing a string around the nasal bone itself so that and it goes around the bone, it comes out and you tie it around the tube. And that way, and then you clip the tie in place on the tube. And that way, even if a patient does yank on the tube, because it's tied behind their nasal bone, it's not going to be able to move any significant distance. So it really helps with keeping that tube where it's supposed to be. Um, and then, you know, of course, all of these nasal tubes, oral tubes, these are all short-term access, right? And so if we're anticipating a tube or a patient needing enteral nutrition for longer than four to six weeks, we would want to get long-term access. So a G-tube, a J-tube, just so we can prevent, again, skin breakdown or dislodgement of the tube. Um, J-tubes and G-tubes can also be dislodged um, just, again, through, you know, going around your daily movements. Um, and if that those get dislodged, then, you know, we would want a, a physician to take a look and replace or um, reposition as, as needed. All right, so next up we have enteric tube clogging. So 
causes of clogs might be inadequate flushing. Um, we want to make sure that we're, you know, flushing that tube frequently enough that things aren't getting built up in it. Um, it could be medications. A lot of times patients with a, a feeding tube will need to crush their medications. So sometimes they aren't, you know, crushed well enough or they're super sticky, they're getting clogged in the tube or you're not flushing adequately before or after the medication. Um, also things like uh, modulars. So for example, like a, like a protein packet that you're adding, um, those are kind of sticky and thicker, and sometimes they can also um, cause a clog in a feeding tube. So we always want to make sure we're flushing really well before and after providing those modulars. Um, some signs of a clog, um, it's just going to be difficult to uh, flush water through the tube, it's going to be difficult or not, not possible to uh, infuse the formula or um, not able to provide medications through the tube as well. And so what we can do in this situation is use, uh, take a syringe full of just lukewarm water, nothing fancy, and just um, infuse the, the water with the syringe and then kind of do like a back and forth motion with the syringe, kind of irritating the, um, the water within the tube itself to try and dislodge that clog. And so we do that for a little bit and then um, clamp the tube for about five to 10 minutes, let it settle. Um, and then after you unclamp, you can, you know, do that forward backward motion again, and then see if you can, you know, adequately aspirate the, the water out of the tube and then, you know, do a, do a flush through the tube. Now, if that doesn't work, um, you can do the exact same procedure, but you can add a tablet of sodium bicarbonate and some pancreatic enzymes and make kind of like a little slurry and do that uh, same back and forth motion, but now with this mixture instead. Um, now let's say you've, you've tried all of this, you're not getting anywhere, the tube is still not flushing. Um, at that point, then you would want to consult, um, uh, if, it's a, it's, if it's a permanent tube, you'd wanna consult a um, GI surgery team or an interventional radiology team to take a look at the tube, see if they can unclog it or if they will need to replace the tube. If it's one of those you know, temporary tubes like a nasal gastric tube, um, then you will just take that tube out and, and replace it. Um, some tubes like J-tubes or Dobhoff tubes, those have a smaller bore and so they're more prone to clogs. Um, so that's, you know, if a patient has those kinds of tubes, we'll wanna make sure that, you know, they, they know they need to flush the tubes well. All right, so that is everything. I hope you enjoyed and I hope you found this helpful. And um, thank you for watching and we'll see you next time.